Hi, and welcome to the Ask Sophie podcast. This is episode seven. Oh my goodness, my cat's just coming to join me. Episode seven, season two. So I've just done what is every podcaster's probably worst nightmare using dramatic language. And I got like, I don't know how long I was talking for, but it felt like quite a while. And then realized, dun, 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 I didn't press record I've actually I talk about this quite a lot but I've set up my zoom so that it automatically records except I paused it so that I could just get everything set up and I didn't remember to press record again and I said some really a stuff so I'm just gonna have to do even better this time round to make up for that Susie didn't get involved because she must have known You'd have heard me say, had I recorded it and put that recording out, that she was just laying over there, not interested. Maybe that was my sign. I do call her my witchy cat. She freaking knew. So that's your behind the scenes. And also, very briefly, uh, I have been listening to Taylor Swift on repeat, the new album. My favourites, Sweet Nothing. What's the second one? Uh, Snow on the Beach. And then there's a third one, Midnight Sky, I think it is. Let me know your favourites if you've been listening. If you like Taylor Swift, if you hate on her, what are your thoughts on Tay-Tay? My daughter told me her favourites and they were all like totally random ones from my perspective. So I was, I was shocked by that. Yeah, Susie, you knew, didn't you? You knew I wasn't recording. <laughs> okay. Today I'm talking parenting stuff for the second time around. <laughs> it's obviously the first time for you, but it's the second time for me. I'm going to share before I get into it, from Love Notes, actually, it's funny because I read out the page earlier, so I knew which page, which I don't normally do. And I'm going to read out the same page again before I get going, sharing my parenting tips, just random, obviously a very uh, well thought out title, parenting stuff, random pieces that I've picked up. So I've just noticed I've got a weird bit of hair sticking up. Uh, you obviously can't see that if you're just listening, but if you're watching on YouTube, you can. So I'm adjusting that, but that I've picked up through my therapy sessions, through my own life, my own experience and what I've looked into because I want to be the best parent I can be. And I always say this, I'm not putting myself on any kind of pedestal or proclaiming myself to be, oh, that was Susie. She just jumped right in front of me there. Uh, maybe that's a Halloween black cat thing. Any kind of perfect parent I am not I'm just somebody who really loves my kids and wants to do my best but I'll get into that in a minute before I do here's my page that I picked earlier <laughs> I did actually do it live before but anyway here we go round two take two uh it's page 114 and 115 the first page whenever you are ready here I am whenever you are ready here I am Whenever you are ready, here I am. And the second very succinct, straightforward one is let me love you. And of course, this speaks to the fact that the universe is always at your beck and call. It's always ready. It's us. It, we get in our own way. And also the fact that the universe, life, source energy, your higher self, God wants to love you. That's that let me, let me love you. Okay, so I'm going to get into now what I've titled parenting stuff. This is based on all of the sessions I've done with children, and there have been many hundreds spanning many, many years. Also, my experience growing up as someone who was anxious, had lots of different issues. I've talked about this before who always felt different and less than and, and lonely and left behind and had major mental health challenges growing up. And so that has really informed what I'm talking about today and also my work and the meditations, particularly in the, in the member area for children. So it, it's just a kind of bunch of different things. I've talked about parenting before. I'll share the numbers, the podcast episodes for you if you haven't listened to those. Susie's walking right in front of me again and showing her. I'm so sorry about that because she just did the probably the worst thing that a cat could do, <laughs> which is you can probably guess she showed the opposite end to her face right at the camera. So really be glad if you are just listening to this and now she's sitting on my lap like yeah whatever I'm a cat I'll just do what I want to do what you're going to do about it 
So this is informed by that experience, by me being a parent myself. And yeah, like I said, the, the work that I've done, my training and, and reading and research. So the first thing I wanna to speak to is, it's a word that I don't use, and I'm gonna share a bunch of words that I don't use and why a bit later. But the first one is I don't use the word teenager or teenage. And the reason for that, so I've got an itchy eye. Um, the reason for that is that there is so much baggage. It has so much of a negative connotation, just that word, that when you use the word, you automatically pick up that baggage. And that baggage speaks to how we tend to think about and deal with and to interact with and, and treat those teenagers and the way that I often describe it is like imagine if you were going to someone's house and you're like my age so you're possibly perimenopausal and the people there were like oh look out there's a perimenopausal woman coming like just mind yourselves people because she might suddenly burst into tears or be unreasonable or need the window open because she's having a, a hot flush or whatever and you knew that people had been saying this about you how do you reckon you'd feel? Do you think you'd feel welcome? Would you want to interact with them? Would you want to go? Mm, probably not. And this is how it, it seems like we've made it okay to think about and talk about teenagers. And then we wonder why they prefer to hang out with other teenagers or their, their friends or be in their bedroom versus interact with others. No wonder. So my daughter is 12, she's 13 in March. She's not officially yet a teenager, but she de definitely shows the sort of, um, she's going through some of the experiences that we would attribute to, to that phase of, of life. And I just think from my perspective, it's like level with those individuals. I, I think that one of the things that happens at that point in the individual's life is they no longer, they've developed the capacity to critically think. So they no longer just see their mum and dad or caretakers as these perfect beings. They start to see their infallible uh fallible rather not infallible and and notice where we're maybe being hypocritical or expecting something of them that we wouldn't do ourselves and this that and the other one they start to call us out on it we don't like this it's not comfortable it's always much easier to point out someone else's issues and flaws versus look at your own right much easier for me to be in the therapist chair versus on the other side of things and so have the self-awareness of what's going on and i think the main thing i want to say is just be respectful of these individuals. I don't actually preach a golden rule which says treat others as you want to be treated. I would speak to what's called the platinum rule which is treat others as they want to be treated. So I'm gonna talk later about what for me is the perfect combination in parenting which is love and boundaries. But, but in, in that love, it's like treat them with compassion and respect. And we say things like respect your elders. Okay, sure, that might be a sort of a, a, a polite thing to do, but why not go the other way as well? Like reverse it and, and respect a child or an adolescent or whatever, someone younger than you doesn't feel loving to me otherwise. So I just wanted to throw that in there in respect of quote unquote teenagers or what I would say, I just use the term adolescent because there isn't any baggage attached to that. And we know what, we know what we're referring to. All right, the second thing I wanna say is I wanna give my thoughts on screens. Um, I'm not saying to you, let your kid go on screens all day. Don't let them have screens. I'm not telling you what to do full stop. I'm just giving my thoughts so that you can use them as guidance and inspiration should you wish, should you choose to do that. So I obviously, well not obviously, but I have two kids and Yara's 12 and he's 10. I have worked, as I said, with hundreds and hundreds of children. The, the interesting thing to me is that like I... I had someone in my life who's very, very toxic person. In fact, I've had a lot of these people very caught up in their mind. They didn't care about the truth with a capital T. They just cared about being right. I don't care about being right. My ego does, but I don't. And I do my absolute best to not sit in my ego. I care about being helpful. I care about truth with a capital T, not what my ego wants to attach to. And so I like to stay curious and, and, and to be open. So with screens, most of the children with whom I've worked over the years have come from middle-class affluent families, quote unquote, good families. And 
bearing in mind these children, they don't tend to come to me unless and until they have grave issues. The parents just don't tend to bring them until they're properly up you know what's creep without a paddle. So this is the norm for me to deal with. Kids that, for example, trying to stab their parents in the head with, with a knitting needle because they don't want to go in the car to a certain place. Uh, and children who are attacking their siblings or having panic attacks or the whole house is sort of topsy-turvy because they're just not sleeping. Really great things, uh, really challenging issues like this. And it's very common for these children to have very little screen time. So to my mind, and, and tell me if, if, if this logic is, is wonky from your perspective, but it can't be the screens per se that are causing the issues for these children because they don't have much time on their screens, but they still have the issues. So I just think to take this very simplistic black and white perspective on it, we're missing something here. Gary V, who I, who I love, says, you know, if we just vilify screens and, and sort of look down on our, on our children and the next generations for, for being on them, we run the risk of becoming dinosaurs. And of course, this is so true. There are positive aspects to them, to your child or your children being on them, to using them. Like anything, there are positives and negatives. But for me, it's more about, is that child, are you giving them a sense of security at home and, and working on their self-worth and so on and so forth, not how long are they on it? And also, the thing that I always say to parents is that the, the most damaging or one of the most damaging sort of components when I'm working with a, a child with issues is what I would call the toxicity of, of fear in the home. And fear comes in myriad forms. You know, we describe it with different words or, or it's disguised by being described with different words like tension and pressure and busyness and whatever. When you drill it down, ultimately it's coming from fear because when we come from love, we don't have all of this, this craziness and this press, pressure and the stress going on. And so if your child or children are on, on a screen for an hour or two, whatever it is after school, and you're just happily getting on with things, you're doing a bit of work, you're tidying up, you're uh, doing your own stuff, there isn't that toxicity of the fear and the tension there versus if you have a child who has an hour strict schedule or 30 minutes or whatever it might be, maybe you say once you've done your homework and you've tidied your bedroom, you can have 20 minutes of, on a screen or whatever. And you're just, you have all this tension and worry that they shouldn't be on it and what are they gonna be like when they come off it? That fear, that tension, that pressure in you, that worry, that for me is more toxic than what's happening with the screen. Okay, so just reading my thoughts on that, and also what I want to say before I move on, I read in a book a while back, and I can't remember what book it was, I'll have to dig it out at some point, because I'd love to know, that when people first started writing books, when we first had books, the, the, <laughs> the general narrative pertaining to those books was, books are going to dumb down people's intelligence. Now, obviously, that is entirely converse to what we think today. Most people, if you walk into the bedroom and see your child reading a book, you just go into raptures, like, oh my God, quick, take a picture, put it on social media straight away, look at my perfect child. Versus if they're on a screen, you just have this fear, oh my goodness, are they being like groomed by someone on Snapchat is going to try and kidnap them? Or are they sending like topless pictures? The <laughs> funny thing is, the kids as a rule are so much better versed in this stuff than we are because they've grown up with the internet and phones and snapchat and stuff probably more women my age who are suddenly single that are doing the the unhealthy things in terms of being on snapchat and whatever because they 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 think differently they're much more up to speed with it anyway I just would like to encourage you to be curious and open and come at these issues from a place of feeling secure and, and, and a calm, centered, grounded place versus feeling in fear. All right, so I mentioned this earlier, I think I did because I'm obviously doing this blooming twice now, but there are certain words I don't use. There are certain words I don't use across the board. I've talked before about dramatic language, so you won't hear me saying things like horrendous, horrific, nightmare. I, I snuck some in like as a, as a joke the other day with my son and he sort of looked up like, what? Because he because he knows if you hear me saying things like that, like all my friends know I don't use those words. And if I ever say it like jokingly that I'll catch their attention straight away. So I don't use dramatic language. And with, with children, 
I don't use the word teenager. I've already said that and explained why. I don't ever say to my kids, you are naughty. That was naughty. Imagine being a three or four or five year old or whatever, and you do something and then you get told, particularly if you don't realize you're not supposed to do it, and you get told you are naughty. So in those three words, there's this complete character assassination. It's not even saying, well, you did something that, that is naughty uh, or, or that I think is naughty because you can't say something per se is naughty. It might be, you might deem something naughty that someone else thinks is great. So it's a judgment that you, you can't say, full stop, that thing is naughty and it be truth. But anyway, how is that small child going to feel? They're going to feel most likely this feeling of shame and no one ever grows truly and, and fully in a long-term way from a place of feeling shame. Now, I'm going to share a story with you, something that happened uh, to me. There, there are a bunch of things, lots of things across the board, but a few things in particular that have informed how I parent, how I've worked with kids, how I interact with children generally. And this is one of them. When I was about eight or nine, I can't remember to be honest, but it doesn't matter. I was on a holiday in Spain and I was with my aunt and we were, we went to her friend. I don't know who this friend was, but they must have been loaded uh, and went to their place in the hills near Mijas. And they had this beautiful villa and it had like a guest house attached to it. I can remember it distinctly like, wow, I've never been anywhere like this in my life. And we stayed in the guest house and they had a, a, a pool and I had these terracotta tiles around it. And because obviously in Spain, we would have been there probably in the summer, it's really hot. Um, I somehow came up with this thing I wanted to do. I found a mop and <laughs> was dipping it in the pool. And then was like splashing it down on the tiles and swirling it around. And the water was evaporating really rapidly from these porous terracotta tiles. And I was just really entranced and engrossed in observing these swirls that I was making and the water lifting up from the tiles. Now, some of you, maybe not many of you will know that I named my inner child Rainbow Love, right? <laughs> if my mate Helen is listening to this, hi Helen, but she will know about this because we've done some sessions together and, and Rainbow Love often comes up. And the essence of her, of my inner child, is so kind and so sweet natured, so lighthearted, just so full of love. And so I can imagine this sweet little wouldn't say boo to a goose girl just like loving being in the sunshine being in this beautiful place just playing no malice obviously and the woman came out and I don't know what she said but she shouted at me and it, it stuck with me until this day and probably until my dying day and like I say informed how I work with children because that feeling of I've done something wrong even though all I was actually doing was just playing, was just having a good time. And so I can really resonate with that. And it is not helpful to say, you are naughty, that is naughty. Ultimately, like I said before, it is a judgment. So I would say with my children, that behavior is not acceptable to me. We don't do that in this home. I expect X of you, not that is naughty. So I would just suggest you ban that word from your vernacular. Because again, the more you, you, you're caught up in judgments, like that person's ugly, that's stupid, that's naughty, that's wrong, that's bad, then the more you're caught up in the BS of your mind and you're not seeing things clearly. You can't say, for example, that's rude because it might be rude to burp at the table, for example, in the UK. But there are some countries where I think burping is a sign of, uh, you know, the fact that you enjoyed your meal. So how can you say that's rude or how can you say something's ugly? One person's ugly is another person's beautiful, like we know. So whenever you're judging, you're stepping away from the truth and you're caught up in the the narrative and the muck and the murk of your mind that stops you seeing things clearly and, and from your heart and your soul. The other word that I've just touched upon, and my kids know this off by heart, they, they'll say to me, is that bad, mummy? And I'm like, you know what I say about this? Stop asking me the question. Shakespeare said words to the effect of there's nothing either good or bad, but only thinking makes it so. And he is speaking to this truth that you, you can't judge 
it, well, when you're judging rather, you're coming at it from within the mind. You're not speaking to truth. Like I was saying about using the word naughty because bad is a judgment, good is a judgment, naughty is a judgment. So the truth is, it's unwanted to me. You know, you might my daughter might say, oh, it's raining, is that, is that bad, mummy? I'm like, well, it, some people might call it bad, that doesn't make it bad. You might think it's bad, that doesn't make it bad. The rain is neutral. Somebody burping at the table. <laughs> I don't know why I keep saying that, but is, is neutral. We can lay it, we can say we don't like it. That's the truth. Or we can say, I think it's naughty. That's the truth. But saying that's naughty, saying that's bad, saying that's wrong is not an ultimate truth with a capital T. It's a judgment. And you might get a load of people that would agree with you. Still doesn't mean it's true because you could also find people that would disagree with you. So who are we to say? Basically, the rule of thumb is the more you can step away from language that induces shame and that is judgment laden, the clearer you will be and the easier it will be to, to parent without producing this backlash and this shame and this, this feeling of needing to people please and so on and so forth in, in our children that's endemic that most of the people, if you're listening, who are my kind of age, were parented in that way. You know, um, we're, we're entering a different era where there's an opportunity to parent differently now. Okay, so I mentioned this earlier, I think, how for me there are these two magical co-cooperative sort of components in parenting and it's love and boundaries, okay? And for me, like I said earlier, I think, well, I might have said this in the previous recording, so apologies if that's the case, but you're either coming from love or fear, whatever you're doing, whatever you're thinking, whatever your action is. And worry is fear, not love. Worry is love gone awry, potentially. Worry is not caring. Caring can come under the heading of love, but, but worrying doesn't. So from my perspective, children need heaps of love and this isn't conditional love this isn't you've done that and so i'm happy that you did that so i'm going to show you affection this is unconditional unbreakable love and i've said this before but i say to my children all the time i love you no matter what and as i'm saying i'm thinking i haven't said it for a little while to them so it's my reminder to do that no matter what it, it's not attached to conditions i might be upset with you when you do something i might not like it i might not like you so much in that moment but i still will always love you you could you could commit the most heinous crime and i will still love you you, you could decide you never want to talk to me again i will still love you it doesn't mean that i will put up with you treating me a certain way but it does mean that that love is unbreakable so what i see commonly is that there isn't so much love, not because the parents don't love their children, but because they're in fear instead. So the fear has engulfed or engulfs the love. So we want to, the question I like to ask is, it, it was, is, the thing I like to say is, you're either in love or fear in any one moment. And if it's, if it's, if it's worry, it's fear. And so it can't be love. So I know if I'm worried, it's like, right, I want to talk myself back into, into what well, out of a place of, of worrying because I can't be loving. Okay, let me just say that better. It's not that I'm not loving, it's that I, it doesn't mean I don't love my child when I'm afraid or when I'm worried, but in that moment when you're worried or afraid, you're not loving your child. Hopefully I've made that distinction clear. You, you, you don't stop loving them because you're worried, you're just not in that energy of love in the moment that you're worried. I, the last thing I wanna do, do is to induce any kind of guilt or pressure in you, as always, particularly with parents, but at the same time, I want to keep it real and tell you my perspective on things in the most authentic way. So then the second thing is boundaries. Like people who, for example, are toxic or have a lot of toxic traits or who are narcissists, typically they have a really loud bark, but their boundaries are weak, all right? There's a lot of people who freak out when people don't do what they want, but then they let them do it again. Really, they're freaking out, whether it's their child or their lover or their husband or whatever. They're freaking out because they know they're going to let this person keep getting away with this thing. Whereas when you have this beautiful combination of love, but also firm boundaries, I, I mentioned this, well, I think I mentioned it earlier, but it might be in the, the recording that I didn't record is that I don't have many rules with my children, but those rules that I have, I stick 
firmly to. Like one of them is around sleep, which I'll mention again in a minute. And the other is about being kind to people and, and good manners. And if they step out of line in respect of that, I'm coming down on them like a ton of bricks because I love them. And people say often, I just want my child to be happy. I don't just want my children to be happy. I want them to be happy, but I also want them to be members of society that add something to this world that's important to me because otherwise I've been remiss as a parent if I haven't done my bit I don't just want them to be all like yay life's great I want them to be adding value not in this way where they have to be of service but that they're quote unquote good people that's important to me as well as that they are happy on the inside so these boundaries and I see this so often, these weak boundaries. So like, I'll give this as an example. Children who have issues going to sleep, I always say to the parents, you've got to make sure if there's anxiety present, we manage that first, because otherwise it's metaphorically speaking, saying, get in the cage with the tiger and go to sleep, all right? If you just try and get an anxious child to sleep. So we manage the anxiety, we metaphorically take them out of that cage with the tiger and we put them back into what they now know is just the bed where they're safe in their family home. So we manage the anxiety and then it comes down to boundaries. One of the things I see loads is people with two kids and the second child goes to bed the same time as the first child and the second child, guess what, is really boisterous because most often the second child is not getting enough sleep. And so the kids will often say, oh, I don't want to go to bed first. Everyone else is still up. Tough. Just because you don't want to go to bed first doesn't mean that your needs for sleep have altered. You need the amount of sleep that you need. And so regardless of the fact that you're the, the second child and so you're the, you're the youngest and so we're all still up, that's irrelevant. So love, and then the boundaries. Commonly I see a lot of fear and then weak boundaries or just trying to deal with things like too little, too late. That is a golden combination. Fierce love and strong boundaries. Okay, the other thing I wanna sneak in is that it's so tempting for us, all of us, we all do it. Let's focus on other people's stuff versus our own. And I see this a lot with parents that come to me. Sometimes they'll say, oh, can you just like fix my child? And they don't wanna do anything. They don't wanna change anything. It's like, well, you can't change the output if you don't change the input. And you have a massive part to play in terms of the input with this child. So focus 80%, this is my rule, on yourself, as, as a kind of rule of thumb, a rough gauge, 80% of your focus on you, your stuff, like are you getting enough sleep? Are you uh, taking care of your boundaries with people? Are you having enough downtime? Are you eating healthily? And then 20% on your child because kids don't <laughs> always listen to what we say, but they will emulate what we do. And the other thing that I heard someone say once is if you want your child to listen to you, your best chance of, of achieving this is to get them to respect you, to like you, because then they're way more likely to want to take your guidance and your advice. All right, I'm gonna sneak this in before I finish. I've talked about this before, I talk about this all the time. I feel like I'm just saying it on repeat. This is the thing that I see time and again and again and again. And I would say to you, if you're, if you're having issues with your child, just check this first, okay? Is that they're not getting enough sleep, and their schedule is too busy, or the home is just too busy, too noisy, they don't have enough time and space to regroup enough white space on their own. Some kids, I've seen this a lot, even if they're missing like 15 minutes a day, it adds up. So before you do anything else, I would say this, be mindful of are they getting enough sleep for them, I would just go on the Google and figure out what does a you know eight-year-old need or whatever doesn't mean that's exactly what your child needs but it's a good start and if they're anxious or similar or angry whatever or crying a lot start here think about how you feel when you're tired and how challenging it is to regulate your emotions and then imagine being a six seven eight whatever it is year old and trying to regulate your emotions with that same stuff going on and not having the autonomy to decide on these things yet so like I say, even if it's just a short period of time every day, that I've seen so often can add up. So please, please look at this first before you start thinking, do they have ADHD? Do we go to the doctors? Do we do these other things? That I can't tell you how many times I've just straight away, you know, I always ask the parent about child schedule and they're doing two clubs on a Monday, a club on a Tuesday, child minor on a Wednesday, every day of the week, they've got stuff going on. And, and, and I know from being that child, 
way back when that was really sensitive and very conscientious, I would be ill doing that amount of things. And most people nowadays are too busy that's to, to be conducive to mental well-being, and it's exactly the same. It's being mirrored in our children. So please, please start here. Okay. Before I finish, uh, the member area for kids, if you don't know, uh, it has 13 meditations in it for children. It has a comprehensive ebook on parenting. And there's also the PDF version of the journal I made. It's a really sweet journal for kids. Uh, the meditations will help with their sleep, with anxiety, and also with any kind of stress issues or, or low self-worth. If you listen, you'll hear that they're really so led and there are so many levels to them. They're really beautiful meditations. That's on sale. I'm going to extend it until next Monday. Um, this, this recording will go out on Halloween, 31st of October which is today, I'm recording it on the actual today. Don't know why I need to tell you that. You don't need to know that, but anyway, now you do. And so I'm going to extend it until next Monday. There's five pounds off. I'll leave the link in the show notes. If you use the code October, you'll get five pounds off. It's, it's valued at more than 85 pounds, but I only price it at 29.99, so we get five pounds off that. And final thing before I leave you to your day is that I'm opening up just like a handful of one-to-one -one sessions for the next couple of months if you're interested that can be on parenting stuff it can be for your child it can be for you anything mindset related or manifestation related please be in touch those spots won't last long and I don't do much one-to-one -one, as you probably know but if you're interested let me know and I can have a chat to you about it all right, that is it from me. I'm praying that I've done everything I need to and actually recorded it this time. <laughs> I might have been slightly, well, I'm not going to say I might have been slightly better the second time because you might think, oh my God, how trash, as my 10 year old would say, was the first time. But the first time I will say, I did feel a bit like I just come out of the tumble dryer because it is, I am fresh out of fresh out of half term, which you can't really be fresh out of half term, can you, unless you're the kids. My kids went back to school fresh. I'm like, oh my goodness, I've had them off for a week. <laughs> Although it was lovely to get them really back on track. And I'm very thankful that I got to send them both into school happy. Because by the way, the other thing that most definitely informs what I'm, what I'm sharing with you on my work is my own experience with my kids. And I've had times where both of them have had issues going into school and so on and so forth. And I know how much it sucks. And you, you might know I've had challenges with their, their dad and stuff around that. How much it sucks to not just feel like, okay, my kid is happy. I feel like my kid is, is safe. So I get that. All right, I really hope this has helped. Thank you so much for listening or watching. And by the way, if you've enjoyed this episode and you know anybody it would be helpful for, please share. And if you're happy to share on social media, I really, like so appreciate that I can't even begin to tell you please tag me so that I can see that you've done it that'd be amazing thanks for listening watching I will be back next week lots of love